Welcome on behalf of the College of Arts and Sciences. I'm Elizabeth Falter. I'm the Digital Media Specialist in the Department of English, and I will serve as your moderator today. Thank you so much for joining us for Book Club. Today, we will discuss The Fire Next Time by James Baldwin, selected by Department of English leaders and faculty. We are recording this webinar, and we will share the video along with some additional resources with all of you via email. Attendees, you are muted and your video is off. If you have a comment or question to add to the conversation, you can share by typing in the Q&A. You can just click Q&A at the bottom of your screen and submit your comment or question. We may not be able to respond to every comment and question, but we will do our best to address as many as possible. A big thank you to Simone Drake, Hazel C. Youngberg, Trustees Distinguished Professor of African American and African Studies, and Sandra McPherson, Associate Professor in the Department of English, for sharing their expertise with us today. Simone and Sandra will get us started with some opening remarks about the fire next time. We will then open up the conversation to your questions and comments. Simone, take it away. Thank you, Sandra. Um, and thank you to everyone who, who is um, joining us today. Um, and I will just add as I get my PowerPoint started that I am an alum of the English department's master's program quite some time ago. Uh, so it is a pleasure to be at this alumni event. So my approach is pretty fairly informal. Um, Okay, so I'm going to start by um, I just I like historical context. I like to kind of situate things. And um, one thing that's always kind of struck me about um, the fire next time is is the way in which um, it can be considered kind of prophetic in the same way that um, people have thought about um, Du Bois's souls of black folk and particularly um, the pretty popular um, line of the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. And I, I um, see that having a, so hold on, I can't see the screen. Okay, a, a resonance with, um, with Baldwin um, at the end of the, the letter to his nephew, that the country is celebrating 100 years of freedom, 100 years too soon. We cannot be free until they are free. Um, and so most of what I'm going to go through are just um, some quotes that um, have stood out to me and that perhaps maybe we'll pick up in the discussion. Um, the, the part of this book that I like teaching the most is the letter to his nephew, the My Dungeon Shook. Um, I do work on Black masculinity studies. And so um, so that letter has been important for some of the classes that I've taught. Um, and I will read them, just um, not knowing what kind of devices everyone is on. You were born where you were born and face the future that you faced because you were black and for no other reason. And then the second quote from that section is, the details and symbols of your life have been deliberately constructed to make you believe what white people say about you. Please try to remember that what they believe as well as what they do and cause you to endure does not testify to your inferiority, but to their inhumanity and fear. Um, and I think of these quotes as being part of a much longer kind of sermonic tradition that, that Baldwin um, participated in. And um, so one of the people that I think of um, most. I like thinking about like African American literary studies as definitely a, as a genealogy um, in which people are in conversation over time with one another. Um, and so that part of um, when uh, of my uh, dungeon shook makes me think of Henry Highland Garnett, who was a, an orator, a minister um, in the 19th century. And this particular um, passage, I think, kind of speaks, he was a little on the radical side for that time period too, but this is a little more toned down, this passage. 
In every man's mind, the good seeds of liberty are planted, and he who brings his fellow down so low as to make him contented with the condition of slavery commits the highest crime against God and man. Brethren, your oppressors aim to do this. They endeavor to make you as much like brutes as possible. When they have blinded the eyes of your mind, when they have embittered the sweet waters of life, then and not till then has American slavery done its perfect work. Um, and I think Baldwin kind of returns to, to the, those kinds of um, antebellum kind of uh, um, tradition of the, the sermon and, and the ways in which slavery is not just something that's brutal for the enslaved, it's, it's also brutal for the um, people who are doing that, that evil. Um, which, um, so here is a, I think kind of classic clip. If, uh, if you um, watched um, Raul Peck's I'm Not Your Negro, this documentary, um, part of it is incorporated into that too, but I'm gonna play it. And I think it's, it's such a wonderful, um, opportunity to hear Baldwin and um, speak, and also such a like savvy rhetorical response that I'm gonna play like the full three minutes, so. I would like to add someone to our group here. Uh, professor Paul Weiss, a Sterling Professor of Philosophy. <laughs> Were you able to listen to the show backstage? I heard, and... A deal of it, but then I was behind the last prediction. Yes. So you heard only some of it. Did you hear anything that you disagreed with? I you... disagreed with a great deal of it. And uh, of course, it's a good deal I agree with. But I think uh, he's overlooking one very important matter, I think. Each one of us, I think, is terribly alone. He lives his own individual life. There's all kinds of obstacles in the way of religion or color or size or shape or lack of ability. And the problem is to become a man. But what I was discussing was not that problem, really. I was discussing the difficulties, the obstacles, the very, the very real danger of death thrown up by the society when a Negro, when a black man attempts to become a man. All this emphasis upon black man and white does emphasize something which is here, but it emphasizes it or perhaps exaggerates it and therefore makes us for, uh, put people together in groups which they ought not to be in. I have more in common with a, a black scholar than I have with a white man who's against scholarship. And you have more in common with a white author than you have with someone who's against all literature. So why must we always concentrate on color or on religion or this? There are other ways of connecting men. I'll tell you this. When I left this country in 1948, I had this country for one reason only, one reason. I didn't care where I went. I might have gone to Hong Kong. I might have gone to Timbuktu. I ended up in Paris on the streets of Paris with $40 in my pocket on the theory that nothing worse could happen to me there than it already happened to me here. You talk about making it as a writer by yourself. You had to be able then to turn up all the intent of a bitch you live because once you turn your back on this society, you may die. You may die. And it's very hard to be a typewriter and concentrate on that if you're afraid of the world around you. The years I lived in Paris did one thing for me. They released me from that particular social terror, which was not the paranoia of my own mind, but a real social danger visible in the face of every cop, every boss, everybody. I don't know what most white people in this country feel, but I can only include what they feel from the state of their institutions. I don't know if white Christians hate Negroes or not, but I know that we have a Christian church which is white and a Christian church which is, which is black. I know as Malcolm X once put it, it's the most segregated hour in American life is high noon on Sunday. That says a great deal for me about a Christian nation. It means that I can't afford to trust most white Christians and certainly cannot trust the Christian church. I don't know whether the labor unions and their bosses really hate me. That doesn't matter, but I know I'm not in their union. I don't know if the real estate lobby is anything against black people, but I know the real estate lobbies keep me in the ghetto. I don't know if the Board of Education hates black people, but I know the textbooks that give my children to read and the schools that we have to go to. Now, this is the evidence. You want me to make an act of faith, risking myself, my wife, my woman, my sister, my children, 
on some idealism which you are surely exists in America, which I have never seen. <laughs> Okay, so um, just a few more quotes for me, and that is uh, to kind of pick up on what, what he said in this interview and um, the ideas of love, fear, and, and religion um, are really throughout the, um, both of the, the essays in the book. Um, and so this one on love, white people in this country will have quite enough to do in learning how to accept and love themselves and each other. And when they have achieved this, which will not be tomorrow and may very well never be, uh, be never, the Negro problem will no longer exist or it will no longer be needed. And then two on fear. Um, white people hold the power, which means they are superior to black and the world has innumerable ways of making this difference known and felt and feared long before the Negro child perceives his difference and even long before he understands it, he has begun to react to it. He has begun to be controlled by it. And, and a lot of his letter to his nephew is really wanting him to understand he is not what um, white people and what society has said black people are. Um, but then also really this, this fear that he might actually um, take, take that in and, 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 and really believe it. Uh, the fear that I heard in my father's voice when he realized that I really believed I could do anything a white boy could do and had every intention of proving it was not at all like the fear I heard when one of us was ill or had fallen down the stairs or strayed too far from the house. I think this goes back to the interview where he is talking about the, the real like literal possibility of dying, right, of being killed, of dying. Um, there's he, there's a numerous times where he also talks about um encounters with or relationships between the black communities and police that go along with this notion of fear. Um, and and he, he begins um, the interview talking about religion. Um, he spends a lot of time talking about both Christianity and the nation of Islam in this book. Um, if the concept of God has any validity or any use, it can only be to make us larger, freer, and more loving. If God cannot do this, then it is time we got rid of him. And the Christian world has revealed itself as morally bankrupt and politically unstable. And again, to go back to Garnett, I mean, this was also 19th century kind of um, abolitionist rhetoric too about um, the hypocrisy of, of Christianity in, in the context of um, the slave system. And then just to leave you with, um, this is an untitled um, painting by um, Buford Delaney, who was Oh, I've missed, I've made, I'm missing an E from his name, but um, his last name. He was a, a mentor and a dear friend of um, James Baldwin. And James Baldwin in, in the price of the ticket has written about the interior of Delaney's apartment in Harlem. And that's what this is a painting of. And I like to think about it um, as, um, as a safe space. That's how he, he writes about it. Um, it's private, it's interior, um, and it, but it also makes me think of his comment when he's quoting Malcolm X in that interview about high noon on Sunday, right, as being one of the most segregated times um, of the week in the United States. And, you know, thinking about how true that might still be. Um, and so I will turn it over to Sandra from here. Um, hi, oh, uh, thank you so much for all of those comments, Simone. And I can't wait to, to talk to you about um, masculinity in this text. Uh-oh, all right. Um, so I'm coming at the fire next time as, um, you know, so, uh, as a non-expert, I, my, my area of specialization is 18th century British literature, but I was teaching this text or have, I taught it this semester in our, um, uh, intro to the major class, English 3398. And I taught it in a section on the essay as a form, 
Um, and so that was sort of the context in which we were approaching the text. Um, we had, you know, some um, interests in formal questions, um, questions of genre, as well as sort of literary history and genealogy. Um, and uh, so I chose Baldwin and this text because I adore him as a writer and a thinker, and um, also because for me, uh, his voice, his style is very um, familiar as someone who, you know, is steeped in um, 18th century satire in particular and um, 18th century invective um, and, you know, uh, and rhetoric and his rhetoric, you know, many people have traced his rhetoric to um, you know, um, biblical rhetoric, uh, his use of parallelism, for example, um, and of course, the fire next time the entire text is in the Jeremiah tradition, uh, you know, sort of a, a religious invective um, that, uh, you know, uh, one, one critic, um, Lucy Ortilla Scott describes the text as a um, post-Christian Jeremiah, post-Christian Old Testament Jeremiah. Um, but for me, what I hear in his syntax and his rhythm and his rhetoric is the sort of um, familiar uh, periodic sentences, parallelism, use of repetition, anaphora, all of these um, stylistic devices that people like Samuel Johnson and, and the great political orator Edmund Burke sort of specialize in. And I've been trying to find out if Baldwin read Burke or Johnson, um, he has said, or he said that he read everything in the public library in Harlem. So it's possible um, that he read them, but so far um, I have found no evidence. And if anyone out there knows the answer to this, I'd be really grateful to hear it. Um, so um, a couple of things that interest me about the text, I'm just gonna put on my reading glasses here. Um, uh, the first thing I just wanted to mention was um, that, of course, the text that comes to us as the fire next time um, it is a, a compilation or combines two essays. Um, that And the first, the second essay was published first, and it was published in the New Yorker magazine in um, November 17th of six, uh, 1962. And it was um, the first personal essay ever published in the New Yorker. Uh, and um, so it was a, you know, sort of unique um, or unprecedented generic uh, experiment in the New Yorker. Um, and it was also unprecedented in the fact of its length. It took up almost the entirety of that issue. Um, and in fact, readers would have reached page 59 of the text, uh, or rather, no, I guess it started on page 59 and they would have reached um, 85 more pages would have passed until the author's name, James Baldwin, was revealed at the end. And so it was this incredible shot across the bow aimed at this you know, mostly white, upper middle class, professional readership who had um, never read anything um, like this. Uh, and in fact, it sold out the issues run uh, within weeks. Um, and uh, I think Baldwin himself tried to get a copy of the uh, of the of the issue, and it was it was sort of sold out. And you can't even find it in um, the New Yorker archives. I think. I read that they have like one copy of it remaining. Um, so it was a massive, massive public event in the history of literary culture in this country. Um, and what what I wanted to say about that uh, or just note about that was that um, as one critic I read points out, the white reception of the um, uh, letter from a region in my mind was already present in its editing because William Sean, who is the editor of The New Yorker, actually gave the essay that title. It was called Down at the Cross. And you can you can see in The New Yorker archives the fact that he scribbled over, he's the editorial mark, of, you know, he scribbled out, um, X'd out down at the cross and wrote in letter from a region of my mind. Um, and uh, 
you know, lots of people have tried to sort of recuperate that gesture by saying, well, um, they it had never published a, a text like this. Letters were familiar as a literary form, um, as a literary genre in The New Yorker for their audience. Uh, and so he called it a letter in order to, you know, make it um, uh, generically familiar. Um, so I've sort of taken to calling it down at the cross um, because that was that was Baldwin's um, initial title. Uh, but I do think that it's interesting that a lot of ink has been spilled on its status as a letter and especially that phrase from a region in my mind. Um, and that was something that, you know, that was not in um, Baldwin's initial conception. Um, Another thing that um, I think is interesting about its reception in the New Yorker was not, it, so it was incredibly popular uh, among New Yorker readers and a, a sort of, um, you know, white book of the month club type readership um, in 1962 and 1963 when it was reprinted as the fire next time. Uh, but it received a lot of criticism from um, uh, from black uh, intellectuals at, in the moment. Um, so for example, perhaps most famously, um, Eldridge Cleaver's attack on Baldwin in Soul on Ice in 1968, um, uh, calls uh, this text um, and, and calls Baldwin a Martin Luther King type self, uh, or says that the fire next time, uh, especially down at the cross, um, espouses a Martin Luther King type self-effacing love for his oppressors, one that amounts to a racial death wish. Um, and uh, declares that bigger Thomas would have been completely baffled as most Negroes are today at Baldwin's advice to his nephew. Um, and uh, later, in later decades, Ishmael Reed has said that Baldwin was considered a sellout to um, uh, partly for permitting the fire next time to be published in the New Yorker. Um, and, um, and then uh, Hannah Arendt, um, reached out to Baldwin uh, by a letter um, th that she wrote to him. Uh, and she was, of course, in 19, early 60s, uh, herself a, a very, um, uh, what's the word, infamous uh, writer for The New Yorker. Her, her Eichmann in Jerusalem was also published in The New Yorker. Um, and she was, of course, uh, also a political philosopher, political theorist. Uh, and she wrote to him saying, um, what frightened me in your essay was the gospel of love, which you began to preach at the end. For in politics, she says, love is a stranger. So I hope that um, uh, Simone and I and you all can talk about um, what Baldwin might mean by love in the text. Um, another thing that interests me about um, about uh, Baldwin uh, and the status of Baldwin in the present moment is he's incredibly um, popular on Twitter. <laughs> and um, there's actually a digital project called Tweets of a Native Son um, that traces Baldwin's centrality to um, the uh, hashtag Black Lives Matter on Twitter. And um, Me Melanie Walsh is, is this critic who has written about this in the American Quarterly. Uh, and she um, tracks, you know, Baldwin's mentions even prior to on Twitter, prior to the moment where he became uh, once again, a focus of our, um, you know, uh, popular culture. Uh, some critics have said that he fell into a kind of abeyance in the 80s after his death, um, and that it was, you know, the publication of Tanisi Coates's um, um, uh, um, Sorry, I'm having a, a brain freeze between the world and me in 2015. And then, of course, Raoul Peck's um, documentary in 2016 that really brought Baldwin back to the center of uh, a, a national conversation. Uh, but she points out that um, actually after Ferguson and the, the um, protests around um, um, the you know the police killing in Ferguson in 2014 that Baldwin was um, very very visible on Twitter um, and in particular a quotation uh, to be black and conscious in America is to be in a constant state of rage and she gives this um, 
sort of literary history of that quote, which actually is not something that Baldwin ever wrote. Uh, it comes from something that he said in 1961 uh, on uh, Boston Public Radio. He said, to be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a rage almost all the time. And he was answering a question about being a, a Negro writer. And so his, his response was really about writing um, and he said, the first problem is how to control that rage so that it won't destroy you and won't tempt you to write in uh, what he called the old fashioned protest way. But what happens, she shows, is that this, um, this more epigrammatic statement is actually um, a um, uh, something that Eldridge Cleaver is repeat is reported to have said to Joan Didion when she was writing, uh, she was interviewing Cleaver um, for her essay, The White Album. Um, and it's this really amazing story. And, and it was really fascinating to me and my students because we had just read Didion. And, you know, I was interested in putting Baldwin in in um, you know his rightful place in um, the new journalism, in you know the, the the rise of the new journalism as a new kind of writing in the fifties and sixties, um, and um, what she what this uh, Melanie Walsh shows is that um, you know this is <laughs> this quote uh, that becomes so so popular on Twitter is actually Baldwin mediated by Cleaver mediated by Didion. Um, and, uh, you know, what happens, Didion sh uh, says in this little um, vignette she gives us is that um, she uh, is talking to Huey Newton and she says, like, wants to know the influences that shaped him. And he finally turns uh, to her and says, it reminds me of a quote from James Baldwin, to be black and conscious is in America is to be in a constant state of rage. According to Didion, Cleaver then immediately transcribes and remediates the quotation from spoken word to written text. To be Black and conscious in America is to be in a constant state of rage, Eldridge Cleaver wrote in large letters on a pad of paper. And then he added Huey P. Newton, quoting James Baldwin. Um, so, I, you know, that was just sort of blew my mind. Um, the fact that this this quotation, which has become so central to um, hashtag BLM uh, and has sort of um, made Baldwin uh, a powerful voice um, in the, you know, present struggles for um, um, racial justice in this country was actually came from or was highly mediated by someone who was very critical of Baldwin, Cleaver, um, and Newton and Cleaver, of course, uh, uh, Baldwin, of course, had a very um, ambivalent relation to Black Power movement, um, and and also Didion, who um, you know, whose politics are not exactly uh, uh, Baldwin's own. Um, so those were a couple of informational things that I thought people might be interested in. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to say is that Baldwin's style, his use of repetition and repetition with a difference, um, his use of parallelism, his um, his tendency to, um, to use um, chiasmus, which is a sort of parallel that then becomes inverted the second time around, right? Um, that uh, there's this, um, you know, interesting relation or connection between the form in which he writes, this use of repetition, parallelism, inversion, antithesis, and chiasmus, and the content of the text, The Fire Next Time, which is very, very interested in paradox, um, in, um, you know, um, you know kind of um, chiastic ideas, like, for example, a vengeful love, or, you um, you know, a guilty innocence, right? The things, those are the conceptual things that interest him and that sort of um, characterize his thought in this text. So, um, so yeah, my students and I were really, really fascinated by, um, by that connection between form and content um, and also um, by other things that I hope we can talk about, like the role of gender, um, in the text and also the role of Africa and the relationship between uh, Pan-African or African liberation movements in the 60s and 50s uh, in the post-war period and, um, and Baldwin's uh, relation to those movements um, and 
his understanding of the difference between the uh, exigencies of the civil rights movement in the US and those liberation movements. So that's it. That's what I had. Shall I turn my camera off now? Nope, uh, you can you can stay on uh, and Simone yeah, will come back. Uh, thank you both so much. Um, and we'll now start the Q&A portion of our book club. Uh, just a reminder to attendees, uh, please feel free to add questions and comments by clicking Q&A at the bottom of your screen and then typing in your question or comment. Um, so to get us started, uh, Sandra, you mentioned this a little bit, um, but I was wondering if you uh, both could maybe talk a little bit more about the connections between uh, Baldwin and ta Coates, um, which maybe also plays a little bit into gender given the, you know, between the world and me framed as a, a letter to his son and then um, the letter to Baldwin's nephew. So I'd love if you both could maybe speak a little more about that. I suppose I, I, I have not read Between the World and Me in a number of years now. So I'm not remembering that well, other than, um, I don't know. I mean, I guess I'll take a risk here. I, I am not nearly as impressed with Ta-Nehisi Coates as um, he seems to be, um, or as others seem to, to be. Um, so as far as, um, Originality, he, he, I don't know what I felt that he added um, to or, or, or brought a different approach or angle or just, um, yeah, I mean, that that's what I remember from reading it, but I also have my own kind of quips with him because um, a lot of what he writes about is what scholars have written about, but they don't get cited. And so um, I, Feel like there's other people who do that work and and more um, more interesting and principled ways. <laughs> now, granted, he might break things down in ways for the public that scholars may not, and he certainly has a platform to to reach uh, a, a much broader audience. Um, but um, I don't compare him with Baldwin, and I know Morrison gave that kind of endorsement that 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 said that he was the next Baldwin or something like that. And I think that she was wrong, <laughs> quite frankly. Sir, I've met James Baldwin and you, sir, know James Baldwin. <laughs> that would, uh, uh, somebody said to, to uh, oh, who was that dweeby vice presidential candidate who compared himself to Kennedy? Anyway, yeah, I mean, I, I think what I think they share is this um, uh, cynicism, this deep sort of skepticism, uh, I mean, Coates and, and Baldwin, and that I, I think is what Coates likes about him. Um, but what I was really struck by rereading it is that is how much hope there is in the fire next time. Um, it kind of broke my heart a little bit, um, you know, just uh, just uh, just to see that some of the things that he's talking about, um, you know, that there's that amazing passage where he talks about in, in the letter to um, his nephew, where he talks about, like, just imagine, um, you know, how how uncomfortable white Americans must be to see, you know, th their, their power being lost, right? Um, and I mean, it's just this amazing um, uh, diagnosis. Imagine how you would feel if you woke up one morning to find the sun shining and all the stars aflamed, you would be frightened because it is out of the order of nature. Any upheaval in the universe is terrifying because, you know, so this idea that imagine how much of an upheaval the civil rights movement is to white America. And, you know, it's like, it makes, made me think about just how many white Americans lost their absolute shit when Obama was elected, you know, and, um, and uh, just encountering that, that diagnosis, that like clear eyed sense of, of wounded white um, 
um, you know, supremacy is, um, was, you know, amazing and brilliant and also depressing, <laughs> um, to see that the innocents, uh, still want to think of themselves as innocent, you know? So I think, I, I guess I see Coates as, um, kind of get uh, not as interested in hope as um as Baldwin is in this text um that he really he really hones in on Baldwin's cynicism and skepticism um and you know uh his critique of ameliorationism Baldwin's I mean um but you know there is still some as, as you know, some of these critics of Baldwin have said, uh, a kind of naivete or apparent naivete um, that remains in his, um, his, you know, in what he calls love. But of course, what he means by love is very complicated. <laughs> and it's not uh, incompatible with, um, with hatred and resentment. What I think one challenge with or difference with Baldwin is that he's he's still he's so entangled within the like Christianity even if as he critiques it and um, you know and that's not that's not where Coates is coming from with, with his his work and um, and Baldwin is just I think really in con in a state of conflict between um, no matter how much he sort of disavows Christianity that it there there's still very clear Kind of tenets of it that that frame his um, his philosophy on 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 race and on citizenship and nation um, that he can't seem to disentangle himself from, and that's that's not where Coates is coming from. I think part of it's generational, but maybe part of it is also simply ide ideological. Um, and so I think there's that difference. I I also off, like often wonder. I mean, I know that he that Baldwin talks about his nephew um, James as as like a son, um, um, or I mean, not as a son, but that he lo he's very explicit about the fact that he loves him. Um, but it, it's not his child, and I do wonder if it were his child, if he were would have been as encouraging of how you have to basically love these white people, turn the other cheek, understand that really they're the ones who are, you know, just ultimately, um, I guess, in pain and conflicted by their behavior. Um, because that's not necessarily even um, Martin Luther King. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'm not even sure it's Baldwin. I mean, um, like the um, the quote that I was reading from um, from uh, who was it there? Um, oh, Ishmael Reed. Uh, he says, you know, when he says, um, I don't. Did I read it? I'm not sure. But he says, um, no, I don't think I did. Um, uh, Reed says, to this day, he finds innocence too comforting a word for those who are unaware of how their racist actions impede the progress of Black Americans. Um, and I'm not sure that Baldwin is saying they are innocent. What he's saying, it seems to me, is that they like to imagine themselves as innocent. They like to feel innocent. They like to be perceived as innocent. And he said, when he says innocence is the crime, that's what he means, right? Is that this desire to remain um, remain in denial about one's culpability is um, is the crime, right? Um, the failure to take responsibility is the crime. So he says, um, um, yeah, um, on bottom of page five, it is not permissible that the authors of devastation should also be innocent. It is the innocence which constitutes the crime. So he's not, in fact, <laughs> saying that they are innocent, but that they, um, that it, it is, in fact, he's saying it is not acceptable that they continue to believe themselves innocent of the devastation, right? Um, and, you know, piling it all onto the backs of Black Americans themselves, right? It's the, it's the disavowal of responsibility that's the crime. 
um, not that they are innocent, but that they play innocent and need for psychological as well as political reasons to imagine themselves to be innocent. Does that sort of square with your sense of that, Simone? Um, I wasn't really thinking so much about the innocence, um, more about how he says that you must accept them and accept them with love. Um, and um, I mean, he does go on to say that these innocent people have no other hope, but um, it is more the rhetoric, I think, of, of love um, that, um, and I guess this is 1962, so we're not, you know, it's, um, we're not into the Black Power movement yet. Um, and, it, and I suppose it does resonate with the more sort of passive resistance and kind of coalition building of King, but um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, um, I am curious, I don't actually have any idea why the um, kind, of, kind of, I guess probably like millennial generation has, has been so enraptured with um, Baldwin. Other than, I, I do think that people aren't reading, I will say that. I mean, even the, the, where he references, one reason I like that interview is because I have so many times heard the um, quote about High Noon on Sunday being attributed to Baldwin. And it's, it's not, he's, he's actually um, citing something that Malcolm X said. Um, and so, you know, so often I think people hear things Right. Um, or they hear somebody else's perspective on some on someone work, and they haven't actually read it. Yeah. Um, and and so I, I do wonder, um, with some of his more contemporary fan clubs, how many people have have really read his work and his wide kind of oeuvre of work. Um, yeah. And and if they would kind of if they would still feel the same way. Right. If he would still be the poster child for BLM, you know, Twitter. I mean, that's in, such an interesting example because, you know, it's not actually his words. And so it's already been, you know, black power fied, right? It's, it's coming from Newton and from Cleaver, not from Baldwin. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, um, that's a perfect example of, so she shows that by the statistical analysis, she does that Baldwin is the most invoked on Twitter after um, M Martin Luther King, Malcolm X and Obama. <laughs> it's like those three and then Baldwin. Um, but, but if that phrase to be black um, in America is to be in a constant state of rage is, is the most tweeted phrase, the most tweeted thing attributed to Baldwin, then it's already a Baldwin that's not Baldwin, right? That's been um, uh, reappropriated and revived by Cleaver and Newton. So, you know, that's fascinating. <laughs> And that might explain, you know, your um, question about, um, you know, why are, why is Baldwin so popular um, at the present moment? I was really struck too by the pragmatism of of the political pragmatism of the text. Um, you know, so the love, you know, there is that moment I was trying to find it and I couldn't find it where he calls it grace. Um, and, you know, grace being right, a, a love that is not deserved, right? And so, um, and I, I think you're absolutely right that it comes out of his, you know, deep immersion in, um, uh, you know, a, a Christian tradition, um, you know, a, a Protestant Christian tradition, American pro a tradition of American Protestantism. And, uh, and then, of course, Pentecostalism is its own thing I was reading some stuff about which I didn't know um about um how the Pentecostal church is you know is seen as um perhaps the the uh you know um the way in which African traditions and Christianity sort of met one another in America in the 18th century 19th century 
um, so there's that, but I do think just the a larger kind of perhaps Calvinist <laughs> uh, ideology, love as grace that, you know, comes, is there in, um, you know, the Jeremiah tradition and the tradition, um, you know, in which the Jeremiah is connected to abolitionist rhetoric, et cetera, is, you know, pretty powerful in him. I was going to ask you, so, but, you know, going back to the question of masculinity and why fathers and sons, I mean, it's also such an Oedipal text, you know, it's like the story of his first conversion, right? It's a woman preacher. It's not, he doesn't go to his father's church. He goes to the woman preacher and she's the first one to say, whose boy are you, right? And then he says, why well, I'm your boy. Um, and so there's that first Oedipal rejection of the father in favor of this sort of substitute father figure who's a woman. And then there's the Elijah Muhammad who he, and then he repeats that, you know, he says, you know, what he understood Elijah Muhammad to be saying to him, a version of whose boy are you? And once again, he rejects this supplemental sort of father figure, right? So, you know, it's, I guess I was feeling like the text is very different from Coates as well, because it's a, uh, you know, despite its interest in Black masculinity and, and the predicament of Black men in particular, um, it's got a lot of Oedipal um, rejection and anger <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, resistance to the father and father figures. Hmm. Um, well, I guess I, even though I was a classics major, I did not necessarily connect it to, um, to Oedipus, but I did connect it to Go Tell It on the Mountain, where he clearly, clearly had a very bad relationship with his father. Um, and, and I haven't read that since my graduate school like, doctoral exams. <laughs> So I'm, I'm like, I am not a Baldwin scholar um, at all, but, um, but I always, I, I always connected it um, to that. And also the way in which his relationship with the church was very much through this relationship with, with his father. Um, and so, you know, one that he like simultaneously wanted to embrace, but also did not want to embrace. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, he spends, he, he talks about the, the church with the woman pastor, um, but he spends a long time on the nation of Islam. <laughs> um, and um, and I, I mean, I, I don't know what exactly what, I'll, what I would want to necessarily say about that, but um, I think they, that organization remains kind of on the fringes um, and is one that generally people are not um, in mainstream society that comfortable with um, talking about, engaging with. They certainly aren't as prominent and active as they were at one point, but um, they're still there. And, um, and uh, they, they were actually the, he frames them initially in talking about the ways in which certain kind of social ills that have affected black people, somehow Elijah Muhammad, you know, is able to, um, to some extent remedy these things, but then he, he goes through a much more kind of self-reflective um, kind of approach to thinking about how that, how that is so, or if it really is so. Um, and um, so I, yeah, I don't. Um... Yeah, I was more thinking about like Oedipal in the psychoanalytic sense, right? Where there's this desire to supersede, to, you know, to kill off and replace the father. Um, and, uh, you know, he does that or he, you know, he does that over and over again, or he at least does it twice, or he stages these possible substitutions right um but 
then he decides not to substitute, right? And just to say, when Muhammad, Elijah Muhammad says, uh, what, um, what are you? His answer is, I'm a writer. And it's that answer, I'm a writer, that allows him, you know, not to be someone else's boy, right? Someone else's little boy. It's sort of like this, you know, this category of independence, it, it, it seems for him at that moment that, um, you know, is the final substitution. Like, I'm not, you know, I tried to be her little boy. I, I'm, I, you know, I, I understand at this moment, I'm being asked to be your little boy, Elijah Muhammad, but no, I'm a writer and a writer means, you know. Um, well, and little boy, I mean, he, he connect, he makes a connection between the pastor and, and pimps. Right? Yeah. Um, oh yeah. It's I know. The same, yeah. It's the same language that's, that's used. So, um, like, I don't think it, like, so it was a different kind of boy that he was um, going to, to be in those relationships. Um, and But I also see both of those spaces as extension of more of like black familial relations. Um, I mean, that's certainly like the space that the black church has functioned. Um, as and um I, I suppose the nation of Islam to in, in a different way, but in um but just the as the expansion of the black family. Um and that's I guess kind of probably more the way that I think about um Baldwin's relationship with um with the church. Um but like his actual literal family, like biological family, he he always could not get around the um, the conflicts with both um, doctrine sometimes, but also um, sexuality. And so it's a it's a um, kind of rift in family, um, both um, his biological and his kind of church family. I'm going to jump in. We have uh, one we have a question from Anne um, who asks, I wonder if you both could comment on this quote from the text. Color is not a human or a personal reality. It is a political reality. Is there a page like to I like I, I would like I mean, I would like to see the larger context in which he's writing that. I don't know. Um, and if you remember approximately where it is in the text, um, if you could put that in the Q&A, um, there's not one, there's not a page number in here. Um, but if, and if you want to put up, if you remember about where it is, um, I'm also just going to read a comment from Josh, uh, who says, the song that Baldwin discusses, I Feel So Good by Big Bill Brunzi, is available on Spotify and probably other streaming services. It was interesting to listen to after reading that passage in the book. Is that the passage in around page 42 where he's talking about the blues? Um, um, and yeah, Anne, page, it's 42. Yeah, page 42. And he says, um, he describes it, the blues as, um, as uh, coming out of an ironic tenacity. And yeah, I really love that moment. It, this idea of the blues as um, uh, you know a, a, a expression of ironic tenacity, because again, like there's that you know that sort of combination of terms that don't quite fit or that are an interesting you know relation to one another. And that that style of ironic tenacity is Baldwin's own. And so it made me think like, oh, Baldwin, he's a blues man. Like in that moment, he seems to me to be self-consciously aligning his own style with that style so that he then goes on, right, to talk about suffering and about how white Americans don't accept death, you know, that they don't know how to suffer and they're babies because they've never grown up. And then he says, you know, um, like, I'm not valuing suffering for its own sake, he says at the end, but 
but I do think that, you know, that an acknowledgement of tragedy and of suffering um, is, you know, necessary for a mature, um, uh, a mature politics, as well as a mature, you know, affect. People who cannot the- suffer can never grow up. Yes, one of the attendees also pointed out that just after that passage, he defines sensuality and white people's fear of sensuality, uh, just after that passage about the blues. Um, and Anne has said that uh, they're using an iPad, but the quote about color being a political reality is on page 101 of the E version. Um, I don't, so. yeah, I don't see it on mine, but I mean, I guess just out of context in general, um, you know, race is socially constructed and you know, therefore it, it, it is always um, political. You, you can't get around it. Um, and, and when you have like structural inequalities and like systems that are in place, um, you know, even when you are supposed to be like, you know, have formal equality as citizens, that substance, uh, you know, consistently fails to be there, the substantive part of equality. And so, you know, therefore color, um, yeah, I mean, you can see color. Anybody who says that they don't is telling a lie. Um, Like you can, of course you can see it, um, but um, we politicize what it means, right? And give meaning to to that. And um, that would, I can't find it in the text, but that would be um, what I would um, would say for that passage. Um, and and just like his constant harping on the fact that, um, you know, that the United States has failed, uh, you know, a fraction of its population, of its citizens, citizenry, and as far as Black people are concerned. Um, and... Yeah, I think he writes interesting things when he's in Paris too about about that um, about the relationship between race, nation, citizenship, um, and the kind of hypocrisy of it. Yeah, I think um, uh, you know in that that clip from the Dick Cavett show, it's pretty clear that you know he's talking about race as a you know material reality right it's like when i'm out in the world i live in, you know and and the the quotes about fear that you were um you know that you were um highlighting earlier simone that you know that you know that the um um it's not entirely an abstraction right or it's not entirely a sociological or political category because it it's a material um, it has it's a material fact that has material effects and he's you know in- interested in different ways in that um uh, but then yes as you say the sort of the, the 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 way in which one moves from the fact of racial difference to the structures of inequality that make it you know um uh, produce, material, you know, it, it seemingly inescapable material consequences is what he's primarily interested in. But I mean, I also think it's really interesting what he has to say about blackness and 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 you know in Africa, you know, the the difference that race makes in uh, Africa, African politics and American politics. So, you know, he says at one point like you know, when he says I'm uh, at the, in the very first letter, like, I'm sorry, um, sweetie, but you're going to have to, how does he put it? It's so great. Like, I'm sorry, but um, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but um, the really terrible thing, old buddy, is that you must accept them, right? At the end of the second of Down at the Cross, he's saying, you know, we don't have the demographics. We don't have a demographic majority that would allow us to put in place the kind of post-colonial power structures that uh, have been, um, you know, and are are recently available in African, you know, newly liberated African countries, right? Um, post-colonial African spaces. Um, and so part of the you must learn to live with them, right, is a, is a sort of pragmatic demographic, um, you know, issue. Um, and, and, 
you know, he, he just keeps, I was doing some research on his relation to, um, to, you know, um, Afrocentrism and the sort of Pan-African arts movement in the 60s and, you know, his trip to, to Paris in 1956 to, you know, which, to the, this, um, oh, what was it called, um, Pranav and others who do post-colonial stuff know, but um, anyway, um, you know, he's, he's constantly saying that the Black person in America is sui generis. It's a, it's a condition that no other Black people share in any other country. Um, because, you know, we, you know, we have no land, we have no nation, we only have this nation, and we only have this history. Um, and it's for that reason that, you know, it's not assimilationism, it's not, you know, I don't see it as his, his position as a kind of weak need assimilationism, but he is saying, um, uh, you know, this is the only country that we have. And he says at the end that actually America is the least white country on earth <laughs> because it's the most miscegenated, right? That's what he's saying. And um, uh, and so it's so interesting to me that he ends with this emblem of interracial marriage as the sign of what it, what it you know, what it means for civil rights to happen, right, is this sort of ubiquity, um, legality, inevitability of interracial marriage. Um, and it's so weird, given that at the beginning, he starts out with that sort of slapstick scene in which he's trying, he's makes out with women and, you know, and he says, like, never, you know, it never was love making as cold. Um, yeah, um, uh, that, you um, his tormented experiments with girls, which were as once as chill and joyless as the Russian steppes and hotter by far than all the fires of hell. Um, so the fact that he ends up with marriage and mixed marriage as this, as what it ought, to, you know, what a sort of, um, uh, what the future ought to look like um, is super interesting to me. And weird, like I don't, I don't quite get it. I, I, I hit that, and I was like, hmm, what's going on here? Especially, you know. Well, I think some of his other novels probably engage to some extent, or, or make sense of why he would go there. Giovanni's Room and Another Country, both. Um, and Beale Street. Well, no, not Beale Street, I guess, but. No, I'd say definitely those other two, yeah. and also um, loving was just around the corner, it was you know, 1967, Loving v. Virginia. Um, but I, I think he had his own like con conflicts around interracial relationships as well, so. Um, I'll say thank you both so much. We are actually, uh, the conversation has gotten so enthusiastic that we're actually past time. Um, so I just want to give a, a big virtual round of applause to Simone and Sandra uh, for sharing your time and expertise with us here today. Um, and thank you so much to everyone who was able to join us this afternoon. Uh, we appreciate your time and your thoughtful questions. Um, we hope you can join us on January 11th. We'll be discussing Persuasion by Jane Austen. Um, and we'll also send out a recording in the next couple weeks of this event. Uh, thank you for being here and we'll see you all soon. So have thank a good you. one. Thank you.